all of you. I know there's a couple folks maybe coming in, I don't know, but if everyone could find a seat. Um, we're gonna kind of just do this casually because um, as the flyer and everything else said, we're looking to have a conversation. So conversation starts community and really gets our, our questions and concerns across. Um, today we're talking with Tina Cody and Michael Peralt um, the administrator and co-administrator for FRTA, Franklin Regional Transit Authority. And my goal is not to bombard them, um, is to just talk about what we've been talking about from the needs assessment work group. Most of you have participated in that, some new faces, so happy to see you here today. Um, and basically see how we can assist each other, the FRTA and the C South County Senior Center and South County in general, because seniors aren't the only ones who utilize transportation in our region. Hi, Hi. grab a seat wherever. Um, so just give people a few minutes. Um, so there's some snacks if you want to help yourself like something we have water we have more water in the back we have coffee regular and decaf um, I don't have any tea here so I apologize if you're a tea person um, but the goal is to basically bring the needs assessment results out and talk about those and we did do some questions which we have a paper copy so people can um, you know talk about so I think what would be a great model is invite you to sit down so you don't have to stand up. But when people have questions, because we are a small space, if we could stand up, ask your question, or make your talking point, um, and we could talk about that in like kind of a group. Um, so wherever you want to take Pretty a long. seat, why don't you sit over with Rachel? <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but the UMass ger uh, gerontology department <coughs> did a needs assessment, and FERCOG also did a needs assessment. Um, between the two needs assessments that were conducted, we were able to determine that transportation is one of the top three issues within Franklin County, more specifically um, South County. So, and that was amongst older adults who were 55 and older who participated in the survey. Um, we have the full survey, we're going to be posting that online. We've been hesitant so far because we've still been picking information out um, and just wanted to make sure that we went forward in a productive way. So one of the, the issues, uh, or one of the things that we've done in regards to our transportation work group discussions that we've had for those folks who haven't been here, and for mm -hmm. Tina and Michael. Do you prefer Mike or Michael? Okay. Whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> All right, Mike. Uh, so um, we've done this particular uh, tree work. So I know I'm asking you to look at all these different places here. Um, I think it's over this one. Sorry. And I'm going to bring it over so no one has to turn a different way. Wonderful thing about post-it notes. They sit bring it over here so it's more something for everyone to look at. So one of the things that we we looked at was root causes, lack of transportation leads to irregular medical care, it leads to different food choices, it leads to isolation, a decrease in social activity if you have a lack of exercise, and those behaviors lead to some really important issues we felt um, we're really connected. We have heart issues, diabetes, cancer, dental issues, mobility, vision, hearing, mental health, dementia, hoarding, foot health, eating disorders, and addiction. Now when you hear those medical issues, you think, how is that connected to transportation? Well, without active transportation or knowing how to use the transportation that's available and the options, you're now having a lack of health care. The reason being is maybe you depended on a support system, a family member, a friend, because not everyone has a sibling, we have found. Not everyone has children, we have found. 
Not everyone has family who lives close by. Sometimes family lives in another state, um, you know, halfway across the country, um, or they have all passed away. So in order to facilitate aging in a community where people enjoy spending most of their time, you want to look for those support options. So by partnering and, and asking some of these questions, um, we figure we can build community not just with the regional transportation authorities, but with the neighbor groups. We have family neighbors with us who's been partaking um, amongst the conversation. There has also been legislators, you know, that we're approaching to say, hey, how come our local RTAs aren't getting the funding? Because there have been um, different advocacy uh, groups going forward and pushing the legislatures for more funding. And I believe for this fiscal year, that's really, it's been pushed through. I think it passed the Senate, but is it still waiting for the House in Massachusetts? Um, so. Okay, sorry. It's okay. But, you know, for, so part of the legislator is supporting putting more funding, but the other part hasn't passed yet. As we all know, with government and legislative process, there's a lot of bureaucratic red tape. So things, unfortunately, take longer than um, we think. So without having transportation, the other thing is rural lack of housing options. So people aren't staying in a community or moving to a community such as, you know, Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland because they don't have a way to get to work. And I know the FRTA has been looking for more drivers to help facilitate different things for overnight shifts and second shift. I've seen ads and things like that hiring. Um, so the cost of living increases in inflation also influence because you're looking at how am I getting to my job? How am I you know, paying for the groceries um, that are going up? How am I affording my car repairs? So now maybe I have to rely on the public transportation, which a couple pieces. One, if it exists, do you know how to use it? Do you know who to call? Where do you get a bus pass? Where do you get an ID for the bus if they require a special ID for seniors or disabled folks? Um, so then, so we have lack of knowledge about the social support. And how we figured we could work that out is having the conversation with the FRTA and then later on hopefully the PBTA because we all coexist around this one area along the borders. Um, we're sending out a postcard to let people know where they can find information. So the senior center while we support mostly the older adults in our community, we're also a resource so if someone says, hey, where did I find this? You know, hopefully we'll be able to partner with the FRTA to have a little station inside of, hey, we have the most up-to-date routes, brochures, we have this information, um, you can stop here. We're open these hours. And even if we're not open for quote-unquote drop-in hours, we're open by appointments so people can come in make an appointment and get information. Um, the other pieces here we talked about was in the future, inequitable carbon tax is something that we feel that Western Mass and South County might face because we don't have a public um, regional transportation like out in Boston and MBTA, if you're not familiar, gets the majority of the funding in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so it's different, you know, they have a high population, we have a population that's very spread out and not as dense. So how can we get from Greenfield to Springfield for work, or even Greenfield to Northampton for work, and not be unfairly charged for a carbon tax if that comes into play in the future, if we don't have access to continual, um, you know, tr public transportation that's always going. And that's not the fault of the Regional Transportation Authority. That's a higher level, in my opinion, because they need funding to keep that going. And that's something we've seen. They always want to do all these studies. It's like there's a need. If you connect all of these pieces, there is a huge need. Then we came upon um, discussing our next topic that I feel should be mentioned today because it overlaps with transportation and that's food access. While you may not realize, 
South County is technically a, sorry, technically a, in a food desert. We don't have a grocery store that supplies every single one of the items that you need. You have different markets. Um, some are more expensive than others. Some have different options that you may or may not need. Like if you have, say you have food allergies and you need a gluten-free product, do any of the little stores that are close by offer those items? If they do, what's the cost? So, you know, are you able to get to a market? Um, and are there stops? Like, for example, is there a, a bus stop in front of the Atlas Farm store? Is there one directly in front of the Millstone Market? And some of those questions, you know, can be answered by the FRTA, and some of them can also be looked at by some of the flyer resources they brought today. But some of us have had a negative experience with navigating websites. So that's one question we wanted to ask. Um, but all of that overlaps, and that's something to really think about how, um, you know, what can we get for a positive outcome from this? And we talked about having a vibrant community, having a positive economic impact, increasing ridership, um, you know, and increasing the value of the public transportation. If you look at your history, Deerfield's going on their 350th anniversary, it used to be a hub for trolleys back in the day, and it used to be a really vibrant hub for transportation, whether you were coming off of Conway, you know, Route 2 coming south, you're going to Springfield to Hartford, um, you're going east towards Boston. There was that little intersection, um, and that has really, you know, dissipated. We're also looking to have um, increased family outings using public transportation. Maybe people want to go to Look Park. How do you get there using the FRTA to the PBTA? You know, just knowing how to facilitate and integrate those pieces. Spread the wealth to smaller businesses because if you have access to that transportation, you're now increasing access to small businesses within those communities. So maybe you don't have to drive all the way to Northampton or Hadley. You know, you can still get from Wheatley and you go shopping somewhere local. Um, and then we're looking for access to resources where we talked about medical facilities, uh, food, um, you know, regular medical care, dentists, and then, you know, to reduce the isolation, which is the key piece. We saw during the pandemic so much change happened where people stayed home because, you know, we had to stay away from each other for COVID reasons, you know, to stop spreading. Um, and initially, we thought it was a real, going to be a short time. Unfortunately, it kept going for quite a long time, and COVID still exists. It's just like figuring out how to adapt to what, quote unquote, I know people get sick of hearing this, what our new normal is, but our, our way of life is, you know, with all these changes. And how did COVID impact public transportation? Um, so this really is to talk about, um, you know, some other factors age was a concern, um, how do you determine um, certain things. Now I know from the presentation on Friday and Chris uh, Gujar, our outreach coordinator, and one of our members, Joe Elias, went, um, I think Grant Fortino was there too, from Valley Neighbors. You know, we learned that you're continuing to not charge people moving forward, which is great for the FRTA. Um, so maybe you could talk about that program. Um, if people don't know how to use public transportation, I, I think you mentioned there was a liaison at one point. Um, I don't know if that exists or if that was someone other talking about that. But just like if people are new to it, maybe it's something we could plan an outing and take a bus trip as a group and see, you know, how do we get from this location as a group to other locations and just have the experience you know, for people um, who want to see how does public transportation work. I haven't had to use it regularly since probably the early 2000s myself, and that was more in the Ham Hamden County region. But when I lived in Hampshire County and I needed a, a ride because my car was in the repair shop, I had to walk almost a mile to the bus stop, and then I had to wait as it looped around once every half hour, or once every hour going south or north because I was on Route 5. Um, in the outskirts of Hampton. So people face those challenges every day and we just thought we would invite both 
the transportation authorities to come and chat and talk about the questions. Um, and we could go around the room if someone wants to ask the specific question we have on our handouts, or if you just want to look at the questions and see how we could, um, you know, how you can answer them, or if you have to do more research, or you know, those types of things. But just to give everyone an overview of what we've been working on for the past uh, month or month and a half or so. But right here. So. I, I think what we'll do is we'll start off first by explaining what programs we have because there might be a misconception of people just aren't sure of what it is we offer. Um, there used to be a time with South County where the upper table provided transportation to elders that were over 60 on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. That is no longer the case. Um, it is open to residents of Deerfield, Waitley on um, seven days a week. So I believe it starts at 5.30 in the morning. So that's the okay, demand response. It goes till about 7 at night. What is it? The response van? The demand response. So that's for elders that are over 60. Um, there is encapsulated in that general population can use that as well by scheduling their own transportation through our mobile app. It's called our access program. And we did bring some information on that. Does that include disability? Would that, which category would that be that? Either or. Either Demand or. response is over 60, life path, um, anybody in a nursing home or a veteran with a disability rating of over 70%, I believe. Um, and then the access, it's just open to the general public. I think we can have people on our bus as young as 10, which <laughs> who goes to you? Um, with you know, access. It's our, it's our program that you can schedule transportation using your computer, a, a phone. Um, if you have IT issues or you're not comfortable doing that, you can call our office and we can navigate you through that process and help schedule that transportation. So if you're over 60, utilizing that for our demand response, those costs start out, I believe, at $1.50 going up. Any programs at the senior center are half price. If you need to travel with a companion or somebody to help you with your trip, they also pay, I believe, half fare. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of what our demand response program is. Do you have to be within a certain distance of the stop, like the PDK? You have to be within 25, we will transport you within 20, 25 miles. So we can't go as far as Springfield. We're limited to where we can go, depending on the availability of our vehicles and drivers. Um, as you know, there's just a driver shortage. We've been fortunate enough where we haven't had to cut any of our services or reduce service. Um, so I guess we're fortunate in that way, but on the flip side, we get so busy that we're now running out of vehicles. So <laughs> with you know not enough vehicles and not enough drivers, that presents a problem. As good as it, as bad as it seems, it's actually good because we can present that as a need. Um, so that's what our demand response program offers. The access program, which I talked about, um, that's open to the general public. So anybody can utilize that. Um, it's a mobile platform. Again, you can use your tablet, a computer, your cell phone. To go online, you register as a user. You can input the information where you want to go, what time. Um, it'll give you a pickup time. It'll show you where you are in the, the mix to get picked up. So if you're first, third, last, show you, you know, if your bus is going to be there in approximately five minutes, 10 minutes. So it's a really good um, thing to have, especially for people that aren't super comfortable with using public transit. It just kind of reassures them that yes, the vehicle's on the way, it's coming, it'll be at your destination soon. Um, it allows you to schedule, it allows you to cancel. Your own trips, I believe, is that a month ahead of time? We can do up to a week in advance. So up to, a, I'm sorry, up to a week in advance we can schedule your trips. Um, so again, it's kind of on a first come, first serve basis with the access program. Um, we're working with the COG on a whole host of things, trying um, different things with social service agencies and, and trying things with hospitals and, and just different things to see if we can kind of get a sense as to where more needs are and, and how to present that. And, you know, whether it's a monetary issue. With the access program, if you're a member of the general public, so if you're under 60, um, I believe it's $3 and up, depending on where you want to travel to. Is that also a van? Yes. Yep. Not a bus. No, I, they're, they're many, we call them mini buses. They're 15 passengers and under. They're all handicap accessible. They all have um, lifts. So if you have a, a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, you've had an accident and your ankle hurts, all of our buses, some of them are low floor equipped, meaning when the bus goes to pick you up, the bus just lowers itself for you to get on. Others, you have to manually put those down. 
Um, there's a program that you may be familiar with, Mass Health. Anybody that's on Mass Health, if you need medical transportation, you're able to get that at no cost. Um, that's seven days a week. Doesn't matter if you live in Greenfield and have to go to Boston. Doesn't matter if you go from Greenfield to Greenfield, Buckland to Springfield. It doesn't matter. Wherever you live, as long as your primary care physician fills out what's called a PT1 um, form. It's a prescription for transportation. If that gets filled out with a primary care physician, they then forward it to Mass Health. Mass Health will make the determination if you're eligible. And then from there, you will sign up to um, schedule those th trips through Massachusetts, which is stationed in Fishburg. We used to be a broker. They took that contract away from us a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a call center. It's not something we provide transportation to, but there is access for that. And again, that's not age restricted. It's just a matter of whether or not you qualify through their, their program. Um, we have our MedRide program. That is open to anybody over the age of 60 that resides in Franklin County. Unfortunately, Sunderland is not one of our towns, so we can't include them in that. Um, but if they have to travel outside of the county for a medical appointment, we charge a mileage stipend of, I believe, 40 cents per mile. We pay our drivers more than that, but um, I'd have to double check. And we schedule the trips for you. So if you're having surgery in your eyes, if you have to go to Springfield, um, Again, we're very short on drivers. I think right now we're down to two volunteers. I was about to ask, is so in the newsletter information that we've had going out to seniors who, or anyone who gets the information, is that spent more of a volunteer driver system? It's yep. not like the on-demand system. Nope. So I just wanted no. to And that's sure the nice thing, by. you know, if you have a medical appointment, say in Springfield, you can't go as far as Springfield, but the volunteer mm. could potentially bring you if we have enough of them to go around. We did receive another grant that we're going to be using to expand the MedRed program. So that might be an opportunity for us to either lower the age or do some other things that we really haven't had a chance to catch our breath since we found out about it. But that's a possibility that we're looking at. Um, so anybody that knows anybody or in this room that would like a position to volunteer as a driver, we do pay mileage stipend, I believe, of 55 cents per mile um, from the time you leave your home to the time you get back. Uh, I do want to circle back around to volunteering and working together for that because, um, you know, but I don't want to interrupt too much, so I just want to just share that piece with you if you want to talk about it um, after, okay. um, whether in a group setting or, or on the side, because um, I see, like, we're trying to figure out a volunteer piece because we don't have the, the budget to pay staff, right. um, and we only have the one one van so if it's needed in one place or another. Our volunteer program utilizes individuals that have their own vehicle. So they go through a vetting process. We check their insurance, we check their registration, we inspect the vehicle to make sure there's a working air conditioning, you know, the vehicle is comfortable, it's not rusting out, it's you know, four tires are all that stuff. So we utilize volunteers utilizing their own vehicles for that purpose. Um, there's a questionnaire, a short question that they have to go through. We have to vet them, make sure they have a quarry check. So, uh, you know, they go through pretty much the same training as one of our drivers would be, with the exception of, you know, wheelchair training and defensive training. So that program works well if you're mobile. If you've got a mobility impairment, such as a wheelchair or, or some other device that you can't comfortably move in and out of, doesn't necessarily work because, again, they're using their own vehicles. So that might be a way we can expand using that grant we got to, to do something. And I'm sorry, did you say Sunderland, you, know, you don't cover Sunderland? We do not. Sunderland belongs to the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. They pay, they pay their um, okay. allocations to them, not to the FRTA. So hmm. um, we do work very closely with PBTA. I talk, in fact, I talked to Sandra this morning before I came here. Um, but that's something that you know we need to try to figure out down the road, and there's just not an easy solution. Um, you know, Sunderland can sign up to be um, part of FRTA, but then they're paying two assessments off the charity sheet. So there's got to be a way to figure out moving forward what can be done. We just we haven't gotten there yet. We've had a lot of conversations with that, but it's still <laughs> still being worked on. Um, our fixed bus route. That is something that operates Monday through Friday, and those are the bigger buses that you're seeing around town that are using the stop signs, or the bus stop signs, rather. Um, you'll notice some um, in town at the intersection, like you were talking about, um, you'll notice we've just installed a bunch of them on 5 and 10. So anywhere you see an FRT bus stop sign, our fixed bus will stop. 
Um, I think Routes 31 and the 24 actually service this area. And right now we're not charging any type of fare for our fixed bus route. So you can get on the bus, you can go to Northampton for the day, come back, it doesn't cost you anything. Again, those vehicles are all handicap accessible as well. Um, and there's designated stops. So again, anytime there's any question about any of this, we're a phone call away. So if you needed to pick up to say, hey, does the bus go to Big Y? Does it stop here? Because not every stop that you see on our bus schedules are listed. We have other stops along the way um, you know, that we have determined to be safe and that MassDOT has worked with us to put signs up to determine that it's, it's an okay bus stop. Is there an effort to somehow coordinate with PVTA on uh, where those two routes where a bus comes down through here, I think it's 31, and uh, where that stop is, and to coordinate uh, with a bus coming from PVTA. You know, at one point there was uh, uh, a park and ride bus mm -hmm. that worked, but it doesn't seem to be there anymore. There Unfortunately, with the funding and money's always the root of everything, right? Um, they've had to cut some of their service. So while our service has remained pretty much the same, mm -hmm. they've had to reduce or reroute some of that. We've looked collaboratively with PVTA to, and at one point, I think a couple years ago before COVID, we actually put an application together so that we could have one bus that would stop at the park and ride and go to points in between mm -hmm. so that you didn't have to start at Greenfield, connect with another bus in Sunderland to go to UMass and, and all of those things. It was rejected. We'll keep trying. We keep who, looking who for Who rejected the state or the two? Um, it depends on where we apply for Mass the funding. Dot. So okay. it could be Mass Dot. it could be um, FTA, it could be a local grant that just is. So it really depends, but um, we look for those and Sometimes if it's a grant that lasts just a year, it's a little bit more difficult for us to yeah. see that through only because once you apply for the grant and if say you're successful in getting it, it takes a few months to get that started. So by the time you get that started and implemented, the year goes by very fast. Yeah, people get used to it. Exactly, they get used to it and then it's yanked out from underneath you because there's no guarantee that it's going to continue. So we kind of look for things like that when we apply for those grants, but we'll keep trying. Yeah, I was looking at 23 mm -hmm. seems to be pretty um, coordinated well with PVT. Oh, the 23, I'm sorry, not the 24, I said earlier. The yeah, and I think yep. the 23, because I think it goes down to Sugarloaf Estates right. for Montague, <coughs> right. but there's no stop in between. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sugarloaf Estates, PVT, I think it's a five minute turnaround, 10 yeah. minute turnaround, it says. Yeah. But um, the other one, was the other one, you said 31? 31. 31. Where does that go? That goes directly down to Northampton. But where in this area? Right? Where would you have to go? Um, the there? intersections here, it stops here. Oh, yeah. It, yep, it goes um, down to Northampton via routes 5 and 10, stops at Big Y, you know, as you go to Walmart. Stop here. Um, I mean, if we look and there's a, a need here for a stop and there, there's a way we can put a sign up, then. That was something that um, we had as a question as to whether or not we could get an, a bus stop here mm -hmm. with the FRTA. So if we have seniors who want to take the bus over the bridge to come here, um, you know, if they did a park and ride and were able to walk out onto the fixed route. Right. And this is considered Sunderland right now, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so there lies the problem. Yes. Um, but again, we have to get creative in our way of trying to look at that and unfortunately, we happen to be in the middle of two big transit agencies. One right. being Massachusetts, who is not rural and gets a ton of funding, and the largest transit authority in the state, other than MBTA, which is PBTA, who gets, you know, I mean, their the fare box they collect every year is twice our actual. Fare, so they the UMass contributions as well, right? UMass contributes to PBTA for the UMass transit. Yeah. So there's a lot of moving. Moving pieces on both ends. Um, they're having a super hard time finding drivers in the area just because of where they're located. There's a lot of competition from other companies trying to take those drivers and entice them with higher paying jobs. Um, so they've had a lot of difficulty with that. Yeah, like college drivers, right? I've seen college drivers try right. to right. do that. Right. Now, so just correct me if I'm wrong. FRT doesn't cross the center of the bridge, it goes through Montague terms, right? Can we get across the bridge? We do, yes, to come into Sugarloaf Estates. Mm -hmm. And then we come the back way through, was it Miller's Falls? Yeah, yeah, Miller's Falls. And, but then would you go we across the bridge? We just go directly down, this side of the river. Right, and mm -hmm. go, and then come around, around, around through Miami's and Miller's Falls. But it won't go across this big bridge. That's PDT, right? Right, so right? there's that walk at the intersection going across the bridge that. Okay, you can be over there. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Wow. So you yeah. can't go over the bridge at all. You loop around which way you come the back way of 47 right. to get to Sugarloaf Estates yeah. and then you come back up. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really... Which is why we applied for that grant right. to yeah. see if we could cut out a lot of that because it deters people from taking the bus. Yeah. If I can get in my car and get somewhere in 15 minutes, why am I going to sit on a bus for an hour? If yeah, to go a loop that way. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we know that there are gaps, we know there are things that have to be worked on, but it's not as easy as just putting a person behind the wheel of a bus and saying, you drive and do oh, this yeah. and let's create a new, you know, route. So, so it would be wrong to say PVTA kind of owns that bridge route? Because they do cross the bridge. They, right, and, and part of what they're doing is for UMass. Right, to bring students exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. I so. believe they're 46, I believe, yeah. is what um, either does or did go to the park and ride. I don't, I don't recall the schedule right. it's not offhand, but it wasn't frequent. No. no. And that, you know, that's the problem. You have a wonderful opportunity, not just for FRTA to go to Northampton, but for the PBTA to bring people who want to work in certain communities there, but there isn't active, continual transportation opportunity. Um, and you know, let's face it, the park and ride gets used more by people who have cars, yeah. myself car included, yeah. who will leave their car there to meet somebody else who has a car. To go. We, you know, I, I don't say we rarely pick people up because we do pick them up at the park and ride, but it's not utilized as much as it should be or you no think it would be. I, I don't think at that particular park and ride that there's a, a sign that says what the timing is and things like that, and that was excuse me, one of the concerns that were brought up is that some of the places that do have a flyer with information are outdated. They haven't been updated in a while. Yeah, yeah I can't remember if it was... That one has one, it's just outdated. Bernardston, yeah, because we, I mean, our schedules have been the same since 2018. Right. Okay. We haven't um, changed them since pre-COVID, other than we're not charging a fare right now. So, um, yeah, so I think going through what we offer, I think I've touched upon all the, the ways that we can provide transportation and help. So that's, um, anybody that's a member of Life Path, if Life Path approves you, it can't be for Meals on Wheels or other services, it has to be for transportation services, we will transport you at no cost, and then we have a contract with them where we will turn around and build up the ride. That's great to know. I know. Now, with that particular service, do you still have to be located within a certain area of the fixed route, or is that more of a door-to-door? That's, -door? that's a demand response. That's a door-to-door. -door. Okay. And yep. for any other demand response, it's a door-to-door -door type situation. Right. And I did not mention the ADA service. That is a service that people, Americans with disabilities, you have to apply for. It's a lengthy, unfortunately, um, application. It's about 12 pages long. It's a lot of repetitive questions, all those things. Um, if you're approved for that service, then you're able, you know, it's a door-to-door -door type service, but you have to be within three quarters of a mile, which is not not always possible. And it's, you know, and if you're looking at somebody that's got a, an, an inability to walk to someplace, so there's no sidewalk cutouts, or they can't travel in the snow, or whatever the reason may be, it doesn't necessarily work for the ADA. Um, that one charges you twice the amount of our fixed route, so theoretically it should be $3 for each one-way trip. Right now, because we're not charging on the fixed route, we don't charge for the ADA. Okay. Now, um, if you fill out a PDTA, you still have to fill out an FRTA. Yes. Right? The same yep. 12 pages. Yep. So, but if theoretically. If PBTA's service area, you would apply to the PBTA. Yep. And then if you're going to use FRTA's service, so if you live in Sunderland, but you're going to travel into Deerfield, you may need to coordinate with FRTA depending on your transportation. Right, we can, we can use that um, eligibility for services in our area. I think you have to allow it to 21 yeah. um, days a year without having to apply for two transit authorities. And that's something else that should be looked at, um, in my opinion. So again, with the access program, that's kind of eliminated, or not eliminated, but it's, it's taking care of a lot of that. We're not seeing um, a lot of ADA applications come in the way we used to. Um, people are also feeling um, good that they can schedule their own transportation. They don't have to worry about you know calling and missing them. You've been home already, and so there's benefits to that. But as we mentioned, and Megan can attest to, the the more popular things are. We 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 thought charging three dollars for the one way trip it was going to kind of be a deterrence for people because a lot of what we hear is you can't afford to take the fixed bus route. It's too expensive, even at that dollar fifty. So we start out by charging the $3, which is the equivalent of the ADA fare, 
Um, and it's, it's widely used. It is we have to turn people away on a consistent basis. Oh, that's great. Um, I mean, it's great. It's a good problem utilize. to have because again, that shows the need. But we didn't expect it to be as utilized and as popular as it is. I would guess it doesn't cost as much to collect that as it does on the fixed rooms. Because we were at the transportation point mm -hmm. on Friday, and Elizabeth presented yep. that. Hundred and the might be one hundred and thirty two thousand dollars of fares actually cost one hundred and eighty thousand to collect. Exactly. Close to being right. Yeah. 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 Because by the time you, you factor in we've got to have a separate counting room for people to count the money with cameras, with everything. We've got to hire those people to count that money. We've got to pay for the software to collect that. Um, it breaks down. We have to pay for repairs. We have to purchase the tickets that then have to get encoded with the tickets. So there's a whole host of things that goes around it. So again, it's not just Oh, let's put the money in the bus and count it and we're done. There's a lot of, of stuff. That and then your done. whole operating budget is 1.8 million, right? No, a whole lot. Oh, no, it's about 4.8. 4.8. 4. 4. Yep. 4.8, and you only collected 130, it costs 180. Sure. sure. So yeah. there's a lot of government funding. In there. So you know, and we're going to try to, um, I've, I've been wanting to do this for a while, so COVID or no COVID, it, it gave us an opportunity to try out the not collecting fares, mm -hmm. but the amount that it has cut down with driver and passenger altercations, and I, I use that, that's yeah. a strong word to use, but you know, somebody gets on the bus and they're 10 cents short, you know, or they've got to sit there and try to count their coins and the person in the back of them is getting impatient, or it just, it, it has made things, the amount of complaints has just dwindled to almost nothing. So there's benefits, there's a lot of benefits in my opinion to it, and um, ridership is picking back up, which is good. Um, but again, even with the free fares, we're still seeing the influx of users on the access system, so. But that's great to know the, um, sorry, spam galore. Mm -hmm. It's good to know that they have the different options and opportunities for that because um, I think I think what the, what the other piece is, is there's a lack of information out there. Mm -hmm. um, even though you know, some of it's on the website, it's not as easily to navigate as some of the other things, and you know, you, you were really great with your responses and answers for that. And I think, um, you know, one of the pieces that we were looking at um, is how, you know, when you talk about the fixed routes, you know, where do you, you know, knowing some of the information hasn't changed since 2018. We have seen new folks move into the area, like um, Sanderson Place and some other locations in here. So people are not as knowledgeable, myself included, mm -hmm. um, for some of the different routes and services. So speaking of Sanderson Place, is that a location that you're thinking of putting a bus stop at because you're on that 47? That's the newer complex that's down by Sugarloaf. It's, it's yeah. actually, go to the yeah. intersection, yeah. take a right. So it's on 47, like you're going towards Montague, that region, North Sunderland, um, but it's it's senior housing, so I think you would get a lot of folks Yeah, interested. we could certainly look at it to see, my we'll jot down it, to see if that's a, you know possible for us to do, as long as there's enough space for us to kind of move off safely. Yeah. Um, you know, we have stops all on Route 2 going in Shelburne Falls that every time I drive home, like, <laughs> because the traffic just goes by so fast and it just, you know, so we have to make sure um, that it stops and, and MassDOT usually gives us the okay and um, there's a kind of a, a process that we go through to get there, but. What I, is know. that process? Because one of those questions came up in the work group is to know, you know, how often do you evaluate the bus stops that you have to see if you need to add additional or, um, create a newer stop at an existing one to make it safer. I mean, obviously for us, if people are calling to inquire about it, if we don't hear about it, we're just going to sail away thinking everything's working perfectly. You know, that's why when people come in with complaints, they're reluctant, but we welcome them because we can't change or improve or, or make things better if we don't know about something happening. So if there's a need, say, for a bus stop in front of Sanderson Place, and there's enough people that do that, and we put a stop in there, and, you know, we're getting traction with, from that, people are utilizing it, it's one that's probably going to stick. We put a bus stop in there somewhere and it's not necessarily on the best roads and we're getting one person every three or four months, we're probably not gonna look at that as something that's that's feasible and, and that we wanna continue. So, yeah. um, you know, there's a process we always tell our towns or the communities we're working with to let us know if they have any anything that they wanna see us do, improve upon. We've got new, we call them semi-seats, 
you've probably seen them in Greenfield. They're blue little benches that connect to our bus stop signs. Um, they're in place of shelters. They're less expensive to do than shelters, but also give people um, that opportunity to sit down. It's got a signal button too, right? Um, we don't one? have. You don't have. That's PGTA. PGTA. They, they get all yeah, the money. Yeah, they get all the money. That's my next question. In terms of cost benefit to adding the stop, obviously it's costing you in your nonprofit. Do you, if you add more stops, does that allow you to apply for more money from the state? No, I mean, if we're adding stops and it's along an existing route, and it does, you know, if you don't have to pull in somewhere and then turn around and wait for five, it's, it's, it's fine to do something like that. If it's something where we're gonna add a stop where we kind of have to go off the path a little bit, even if it adds two minutes to the schedule, it doesn't sound like a lot, but at the end of the day, um, it could be something missing a connection when we get back to the transit center um, in Greenfield, so. In terms of the piece of the pie, my number's gonna be off again, but I heard statewide funding, which is hard to identify. Mm -hmm. This region, especially FRTA, serves the most towns, mm -hmm. the longest distances, mm -hmm. but you only got a small piece of mm -hmm. it, maybe 9%, <laughs> is that about right? Yeah. We, have, we, we, have 40, we have 41 towns that the FRTA serves. Right. We're the largest geographical transit authority in the state. We cover over 1,100 square miles. And the way that it works is because we're so rural, there's a pot of rural money and there's a pot of urban money. So we are 100% funded with that rural collection of money. Whereas Berkshire or even PBTA, some of the other transit authorities, they might receive some urban funding, which we call 5307, I'm sorry. And um, they might receive some rural funding as well. So we don't have that other piece to fall back on. So because it's ourselves, Narragansett, um, Nantucket, sorry, yeah, yeah. and uh, Martha's Vineyard, yeah. we're the three rurals in the state. So any federal funding that comes in, we have to split amongst us. And so given that they're islands, Martha's Vineyard obviously has a much higher density of people in the summertime, so therefore their ridership is way more than ours is even year round. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily get split up evenly, but and yes, we're very is small. Close to 1100 miles. Right. Now, Greenfield is a city, though, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it doesn't get urban money, even though it's considered it's only city in your. It's it's a it's a federal definition of urban. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a it's an area um, greater than I think fifty thousand. I think fifty thousand is uh, that small urban. And then, uh, there's a, there's like a break even point. So our our region isn't qualified as urban. Just some ironically that I think in the eighties when the factories were booming, it had a bigger population, right? Probably. Yeah. yeah. And and out of just to give you context, out of the forty one towns that we serve, there's only maybe nine or ten towns that actually get that fixed route service that we've been talking about. Wow. That's and so really the other thirty one towns um, have to rely on this demand response service wow. that if you're not over sixty, you're kind of mm -hmm. out of luck. Um, we have the access programs, but we've only just recently branched out with that, so that's not touching upon the majority of the towns. Where we've started kind of with the most populated, and we're trying to work our way out. We've um, recently, Southampton, um, we have gotten on um, this program with the access stuff, which we're kind of doing on a trial basis. And then the next one will be Hilltown out in Goshen that we're right. trying to get them started with it as well. And you know, the nice thing about that is, is if it's successful and we can start with that and the funding comes into place, they can then start offering general public transportation. Is Hilltown is a pseudo micro transit system, are they something, like volunteers or? They may have. We heard them present on Friday, mostly it's about food and food security, mm -hmm. but how they got the food. Yeah. Um, how can we help with FRTA and help out, I mean, win-win, we're looking to plan a, a legislative breakfast sometime. And the that's fall. always a good start. Yes. Yeah. And so we're, and we're, with, we're yeah. super, super fortunate that we have legislators such as Natalie Blight, right. who's you know co-chair of the RTA caucus and um, on the transportation Senate ways. So you know, and, and she's from yes. a rural area, so they understand that. And I think it's trying to get. And now that we have former Senator Gobi, who's now the rural, um, the director of rural affairs. I think that helps as well. So I think finally, <laughs> we've been doing this long enough, finally maybe we'll start getting some traction with what we've been trying to say for a very long time that you know we need to build up more transportation resources for people that are um, in need of them. I know where I live in the town of Buckland, I 
There's, there's nothing. I mean, if my car breaks down or something happens. And because in addition, one of the factors that we found or, you know, doing some of the research is not only is there no public transportation, but those areas are also considered ride share app um, deserts because people, you know, don't get enough requests, so there's not that service available. And I don't even think that there are taxi companies that go that we far. We used to either. have two taxi right. companies in Greenfield, they're no longer. Uh, Megan can tell you that they did, you know, the startup of, of kind of the pilot that we started with the micro transit was trying to see who we could get in for Uber and Lyft. And there's not, not even in Greenfield. <laughs> Wow. So, um, you know, so that so we kind of say that our micro transit, which is the axis, is kind of like our take on the Uber and Lyft, except again, all of our drivers are vetted. Yeah. Um, they have to go through drug screening, they have to go through a quarry process, um, defensive driving, wheelchair training, um, the list goes on. So, you know, they're vetted. It's not like, unfortunately, sometimes you don't know who you're getting if you call an Uber. Right. Um, but, you know, that's. Hopefully, what we we're trying to use to get people to get comfortable with. Um. Well, one of the things that you know we talked about doing as you know to to really present some of the information. I you, um, I know there's some other questions on here that people have or questions about um, you know the website. How often do you update that? Um, because you know, are you looking at making it more accessible for people who have visual or audio, you know, visual disabilities? All of our, our website we designed with somebody who took into consideration all the ADA um, things that have to make, you know, um, we have translators on there that they can scroll and make font bigger, smaller. Um, we, the problem is, is that we have a lot of information and you're trying to cram a lot of information on your website. So if you're looking at a phone, our website's designed so that, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier to navigate on phone, but it's still, it's a lot of information. So trying to determine what to put in the website, what not to put in the website, some of it we're obligated to put down. We have an open government page that we require to update, you know, all of our board meetings and agendas and the notes, that all has to be put on there. So unless you're going to the website and knowing exactly what you're looking for, I can see definitely how it, it becomes challenging and, and overwhelming. There are some ADA screening yeah. companies for free. Mm -hmm. Maskerson for the blind is familiar with them. Have you ever had a, a ADA screener go through and give you a rating? How well you're We haven't done it with a rating. The person yeah. that helped design the website yes. went through and kind of had his checklist, which sure. again, probably as things change, um, could be updated, but um, we're a very small office. We don't have an IT person, so I'm the website person that goes <laughs> in to update everything and make changes. And yes, Same here. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to mention, we've hired, we have money to, we've hired we have a marketing consultant to um, go do a lot of communication <coughs> issues and what they've created a list of recommendations and changes to upgrade the website to make it more friendly and user, easier also to be able to see it better on your phone if you need it. Um, and so we have funding set aside for that uh, for the next year. So is, is that something you're working with them to accomplish? Yep. Great. And there was a question over this way? No. One of the things uh, uh, any senior group is trying to do is get the word out of the availability of demand response and similar programs. At this point, how many of demand responses are you refusing? How many are you unable to meet at this point? Well, I mean, we have our demand response. We typically will put that through. That's separate than the access. So when we say that we're refusing rides, it's the access as a general population okay. yeah, one that okay. we have. So, but the group, in other words, the group that's there now saying, you know, I've got to get to the doctor Tuesday. How many of those folks do you have to say, geez, we can't do it Tuesday? Very little. Right. Yeah. So I mean, if you call, we know that it's a medical appointment and it's something that's a necessity. That becomes priority over, unfortunately, going to a hairdresser. It's mm -hmm. equally as important as it's, it might seem to somebody. We have to take those medical well, and nutritional Well, it's important to trips. the person that wants to get to the hairdresser. Too. Right, <coughs> right. Uh, does the uh, mass health users, do they get priority? or? We don't do anything with mass they health. They don't use your van? Unfortunately, okay. we, okay. like I said, that ended a couple of years ago. We've heard stories through Massachusetts, the broker that put it to so get over that it's hard to get through. So you're saying you have the capacity for mm -hmm. a good deal more if, if, if folks can get the word out. Right. Or 
And again, we keep track of those refusals. Michael mm -hmm. report, we do reports every month. So we keep track of those refusals and suddenly we're seeing, you know, 10 refusals a month from South Deerfield to people needing to get into Greenfield. Because I'm hearing you, you don't have, there's a real driver shortage. And, you know. Well, that, and that, again, that's for our access. I can't even yeah. call it a okay. pilot program anymore because it's there, but that's for our micro transit um, program. So that's what we're looking to expand so that there's more access for the general public. But what happened was when we expanded the access program <coughs> to these areas, it, it actually helped Deerfield because again, we used to have Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like from nine to three transportation only for seniors over 60. And since we've been doing the micro transit, we've expanded that because the drivers are able to be in this area anyway. So I believe it starts at 5.30 or 6.30 in the morning and goes till seven in the evening. Weekdays, you know, so Monday through Friday? Monday through Friday, and then on the weekends it's 9.30 to five. So, you know, if somebody wants to go to the library that's opening up in Greenfield on a Saturday, um, that's a possibility. So it might help to clarify if, if I may. Um, so the demand response system, the way, the way it, we've been kind of using the access program term and demand response interchangeably because it now has kind of become interchangeably. It used to be there were demand response vans just set aside for those over 60 and those with disabilities. What happened was, is there were often empty seats on those vans or those minibuses. And so what we've done, the, the FRTA has done, is has used technology like the ride share, like the Uber and Lyft. You can now book a ride if you're 60 and with disability on those vehicles. But what happens is, uh, and you have priority. If you're over 60 and if you have a disability, you have priorities on those seats. You're the first come, first serve. If there's any seats left over, those open up to the general public. So what's being refused is those general public seats. Um, and so now instead of just a demand response van that runs on a particular route on certain days, certain times, there are now vehicles going everywhere from door to door all the time. And it's really efficient because it's using this computer system that knows how to best to get to this point A to point B and where, how to fill these seats. Um, and so for those who are 60 and with disabilities, there's definitely capacity on that system. It's become so popular with the public too though because it now provides, it fills in those big gaps where we used to have like the spokes that only, you know, there were huge gaps where no one could get a ride at all. Now those are filled with this micro transit access program um, and it's been very, very popular. And so that's what's being kind of been hard, harder to fill these days because it's become so popular. And it used to be, you know, Megan would be the only person on the vehicle to get from Deerfield to Greenfield and now she might have to share that with three other people because of the way that the system and the algorithm works. It tries to pick up people along the routes, whether it's on the way back or two. So again, they're up to 15 passenger um, vehicles, so. We allow seniors to book in advance. I know a lot of people have, particularly medical appointments um, or anything that way. That's why we get, we're able to give them priority. Um, we don't open up the app to general public <coughs> until a week out, but we will allow anyone to schedule next day, same day, real time. Um, so if there's room on the vehicle, um, you are able to do it because it's so popular. If you call today to go to the grocery store or to go to the pharmacy, um, you need to be able to be flexible. If you call in the morning and say, oops, I forgot I have a doctor's appointment today, it's probably unlikely that you'll be able to get a ride because it's it's just but very we'll very popular. And they'll give but, you options. But all of our you know I mean we're a very small office, but you know we we work with people to try to renegotiate times um, to see if there's a way. We, we try not to refuse uh, anyone, uh, but particularly we try not to refuse um, seniors. So so just want to be clear the on demand for seniors. That's only you have to book a one week in advance, right? Not further than that, not over. Can book the month ahead. If if you're a senior, we call it demand response. If you're mm -hmm. not a senior, we call it. So demand, yeah, so demand response. Can you book a month ahead? We allow you to book. Yes. Yeah, so, and we do that specifically because we know seniors have appointments yeah. scheduled in advance, so we're able to take that. So we want to make sure that those get loaded in first. And then as we get closer to the same day of service, a week before we open up the scheduler to the general public so people can start filling in those empty seats that Megan talked about. So seniors prefer more yep. advanced notes. And it helps you right. fill exactly. the puzzle. So we tell you, if you go to the doctor's appointment and before you leave, they say you have a three o'clock appointment, 
next week. <laughs> but, call. But mm -hmm. our system is, is flexible that if you call us and say, oh, I need to go to the pharmacy tomorrow, we don't turn you away. We look and see where's their room in the schedule that we can send you. Yeah, here's the second part of that question is, sounds like it's easy to get there to book it. But how do I, so let's say I'm a senior, I go to the doctor, and I'm supposed to have an hour, but I get pushed back, and I end up there for two hours. Mm -hmm. But I've already booked my on-demand to come home, because I expected it to be an hour. How does that work? So you either call us, and, and we'll try to renegotiate and get the driver to go back. You might have to wait a little bit. Yeah. Or if you have the app, then you can try to, to change the trip. The, time. Okay. the one thing I will say is we can't do things like get somebody to work Monday through Friday. You can't bring them, you know, to physical therapy five days a week. It just because of the way that the schedule works, it would just end up being that we can't, you know, so we can fit you in, that's fine, but we can't do what we call subscription type service. Um, and the other thing I will say is it used to be on the demand response, you'd have to pay cash only. So you get on the bus, you have to fumble for your change, you have to do whatever. You can now call the office and if you have a credit card or if you want to send a check in or come into the office with cash, we can actually put money on your account. So when you get on the bus, all they do is push a button and that fare is deducted from um, your payment. Or we have what's called go cards, which are you know, like plastic credit cards. And you can load a value on that. So you can put $10 on that, you get on the bus, you tap it on the fare box and it deducts that money. So you don't necessarily have to worry about um, having the exact change or that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was uh, wondering with microtransit, um, would, uh, have you explored uh, options of uh, maybe partnering with other organizations in Franklin County? Um, is there a need for that? Um, I know uh, drivers is something you're very Drivers are something we're looking for. We do have a program for individuals that are working second and third shift. We try to, to match them up with um, a ride to do that. We've got one company right now that we're contracted with and they're coming from Springfield. So the cost is just crazy stupid. So, you know, if we had another vendor in the area that, you know, was um, able to do so and they had their own vehicles or something like that, we could contract with them for things like that. Um, with the demand response, I mean, we have to utilize all of our vehicles. So if people wanted to help us out that way, they could apply for a job, um, you know, to become a driver at FTM, or they could try to become a volunteer and then that doesn't, you know, you just get a stipend check at the end of the month once your manifest is turned in. The, the biggest um, <coughs> speed hump, I'll call it, okay. um, with what you're talking intended. about, <laughs> is um, we have very high and very rigid requirements with who we will work with. Mm -hmm. um, our background checks um, are are non-negotiable. Our training requirements are non-negotiable. Our insurance requirements are non-negotiable. Um, and that just makes the cost of operating service so much higher where a taxi company may not be able to make a profit off of partnering with us. Um, that's part of the issue with when the FERCOG was trying to bring Lyft into the area to help provide some gap service. Um, there's just not enough population, um, so there's just not enough money um, for a for-profit entity um, to kind of come in and, and, and do something. Um, we, Tina said the, the one company we're working with now for helping to deliver second and third trip transportation comes out of Springfield. Um, and we're, we're happy to have them because it helps fill the gap, but again, it's very costly, so it's not something that you could you know, swoop in and undercut the competition because we require so much of you, there's not a lot of fat left right. over. When they're coming from Springfield to pick yeah. up somebody from Orange to bring them back to Greenfield, then they have to get yeah. them back to their home base in Springfield, it adds up. But not a lot of people want to sign up for transportation at 11 o'clock at night. Our mission is not to deliver <clears throat> cheap costing transportation. We want to make sure you get to where you're going safely. And that's a good, yeah. you know, it's a good thought to have. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and to just go back really quick, you talked about um, your doctor's appointment running. <coughs> it happens all of the time. And if you're part of our demand response system, many of the doctor's offices in Franklin County already know us and they'll call on your behalf. Um, you will never find 
a pile of bones at any corner on any street <laughs> in Franklin County because, because we just don't we don't leave people behind. So if there's ever an issue, we just find a way to make it work. I'm curious just about um, when you started seeing changes or when demand response sort of became a thing and why that became a thing. Um, and if there's any sort of like direction you're looking at that is going to become the next thing. So you mean with the micro transit? How do you see anything? It? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the demand response. I've been, been here for over 20 years now. We've always just operated the demand response kind of the way that it is. We've made some tweaks and some changes, uh, but that kind of stays the same for the most part. Like I said, when we started talking about micro transit. I was hesitant. I was like, there's no way people are going to pay $3 for a one-way trip. This is just not going to work. We're in a rural area. It's not going to be, and prove us wrong. Um, and was that the 2018 mark? <coughs> These are scheduled of We received a, a discretionary grant. We had to be innovative, and then it had to be something that we thought we could sustain on our own after this three-year grant went away. So we kind of dove in and said, let's try it. Um, you know, and it just did something that stuck, and it just kept growing. And Believe it or not, COVID helped us in that realm um, a lot uh, because you know we, we were just starting out. People were it gave us time to kind of pause and see what we needed to do, how we needed to get people there. There was hesitation. There was a lot of what ifs, but it really um, the timing for us, even though COVID was horrible, it really kind of helped launch this this program. And um, I don't know if there's another next thing kind of coming up. You know, our hope, like I said, we have 41 towns. Our hope is. You know, in a perfect world, I'd love to see some variation in all 41 towns. Probably not going to happen while I'm still able to work. But, um, you know, we're making strides on that. We're getting into Southampton. We're now getting into to Goshen and some of those more hill towns. And so as we get into those places, you know, we can get into Goshen. And, and maybe that's going to branch off so that we can get to Ashfield. And then from Ashfield, we can, you know, so it's kind of our hope that we can branch this out. But it's largely dependent, again, who actually uses the service. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we branch this out and everybody said, hey, there's a need, we really, really want this. We've done all the studies and people want this. And we launch it and nobody uses it. We look ridiculous because we've put all this effort in and, you know, we've done all the things they've asked us to do and um, we just kind of fall flat. So, lucky for us with the micro transit, um, you know, it took off. And so that was, so we're hoping that we can kind of micro use that micro transit to kind of branch off into the, the more rural towns because it's been successful in the higher population areas like Deerfield and Greenfield and Montague. But to try to get it out to some of the more rural towns like Conway or Ashfield or Huntington, you know, places like that, that's really hopefully where our goal is going to be. And so back to sort of shift back the second shift and third shift. Mm -hmm. You know, at the, one of the presentations at the Transportation Forum Friday, was Pioneer Valley PC. So Pioneer Valley P Planning Committee has a program for PBT, and I don't know if it's FRT schedule too, but it color codes if a bus route stops at a second shift or a third shift. You guys, have you heard about this? No, because all of our services start at seven, so they stop so at don't seven, have, seven. You don't even, it won't even work for you because you don't have no, it yet. Right. Okay. Right. I think the we last have, bus we have coming into the garage is like 7.30, 7.45. So we have done a survey of all of the major employers in Franklin County to find out when their shift times are to try and coordinate. And unfortunately, they're incredibly variable. Yeah, everybody and was your standard like 7 to 11, yeah. and then 11 to Even just along in, in Deerfield, Pelican, all the others, they're all completely different. So it's been, we've been, we've been trying. We've definitely been not trying on that. So, um, so just go back to what you're talking about with um, you know, having a contractor in Springfield providing the after-hour service um, and, and moving and looking at what you even have for employees for day service. We were thinking of, you know, asking to see, because we do have a lot of people who are retired or semi-retired who are looking for something else to do and they're mm -hmm. in good health and could, you know, probably pass your physical exam and quarry and all of those. but maybe doing a hiring fair, like at the senior center, um, whether it's here or at the mm -hmm. Sugarloaf Street, to give that opportunity. Um, I know Michael has already RSVP'd for the informational fair and cruise night, which we're doing in August, yep. and it was wonderful to have you there last year as well. And to also see if you'd be interested in also 
Um, maybe, I don't know if the, I believe you require an ID for folks um, to use certain transportation or you don't No, anymore. it used to be on the fixed bus route if you wanted to get the half fare and you needed to present an ID or a driver's license, just something verifying your age. Now that we're free for another year, you don't have to. We don't have to, but I believe that PBTA requires mm -hmm. one. So okay. again, depending. Um, yeah. We do have a system at our office where they can take a picture and do a senior ID. Um, but you know, it just needs to be set up and coordinated and it comes along with a demand response application. Um, and that's the other thing. I think you brought some applications. Yep. Um, if you're not already registered for our demand response program, we've got applications. Even if you think you're not going to use it, just apply. Have us get, you know, we can get you in our system. The initial one lasts for three years. You never know if your car is going to break down, if your person that you go grocery shopping with can no longer bring you, you sprain an ankle, it's that effect. At least then you're in the system so that if you need to use it, it's there. It doesn't cost anything. Um, just to have it as a, a secondary source of, of whatever. Um, you know, we just ask name, date of birth, address, we have an emergency contact, whether you use a mobility device, it's, it's fairly simple. It gets mailed into the office, and we just send you a letter on how to schedule your transportation. Um, but again, with that, if, if somebody would like a senior ID, they're already in the system, so all they could do is call, and we can set that up for them. Great. But, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Grace. Oh, sure. Yeah. I have a paratransit question. Yep. So I applied for paratransit status with PBTA. I filled out the onerous troll page. So you're talking ADA. Yeah. That's different. Yeah, okay. Okay. And I was approved. And somewhere in their literature it said that having been approved by them meant that I was approved for the other transit authorities in the state. Mm -hmm. You are, but you can only utilize that as a visitor. So. If you've been approved by PBTA, which you have been, and you need to come into the FRTA, say you get to the JW Over Center and you want to go from there to Big Y, but you want to use the ADA service, we, you can only use the, that status for up to 21 days out of the calendar year. So you only really have 21 trips to utilize that service. You would then have to, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It needs to have a little work. We need to find a way to see if we can streamline that a little bit. Um, now, what's the difference between, maybe you explained this earlier, ADA person taking so the, the FRT, I just call it the FRTA van. Mm -hmm. um, well, the ADA, same. again, is set up for people that have disabilities that cannot access the fixed route for whatever reason, cognitively, mobility impaired, they cannot get on one of the big fixed bus routes that you see in town. There's just, they can't do it. Then you would apply for ADA, um, at, but you have to be within three quarters of a mile of a fixed bus route. Well, stop. I did that with PBTA and got approved. Right. right. So if you're approved with them, mm -hmm. then you're eligible for service. You then would need to coordinate your rides with us. PBTA would have to send us your eligibility. They would have to fax that oh, for okay. us so that we have That's it on what file. I was wondering. How but, did you know that I'm approved for ADA? Right, because they'll send us the eligibility, we'll put you in our system, and then there's a, a thing in there that we know we can only do 21 trips. Okay. Well, but you're in Sunderland, are you going to? But it's coordinated, so if she wants to go over the bridge, to, like the PBTA we've determined right. owns the service to the bridge. So if she goes to a stop that drops her off in Deerfield, she could then catch an FRTA system to go up that way. So it would just be coordinating Grace through the PBTA. There's a, a person over here who had a question. Yep. Come. Basically, most of the services you're talking about are not Sunderland. Right. Um, and basically, it's more Sunderland's choice than your choice. And it's because of funding and stuff. So one can understand why Sunderland would go with PBTA because of the apartment complexes and the ties to UMass and the, the age, um, uh, popu the population in Sunderland. Is there any way that they could split off? Can you take just people who are over 60 to, if, if you were paid, as opposed to I'm taking your whole <coughs> funding in. If, you, if we're given this amount of funding each year, you would take in um, services and for- That's what we're trying to determine is to see how that would work because it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a strain on our system already that's over you know, with the drivers and with the vans all, you know, so, and again, with them having such high ridership and they have peak times and 
different things that would, you know. This would this would just be for people over 60, mm -hmm. not the general population. Yeah. And, and most of the general population is, you know, going. We have to find a way. I mean, if we were in a perfect world, we were all on the same um, software that coordinates these trips, it would be a piece of cake. Okay, because we could just, just run our reports to say Sunderland, Deerfield, Wheatley, done. Um, but it's not set up like that. So um, it could be a matter of, of maybe that becomes a test issue for us with some grant that we're able to get. If um, you had the money for it. You know, and try to utilize that with one van or two vans or however that might look. Um, but again, it's just... If Sunderland could coordinate, you know, like they're going to give this much amount of money to PDTA, and they're going to give this much amount of money to right. you guys. I mean, we're working. You know, right is it now, possible to do something like depending that? Depending right? on when the budget gets established and settled and all of this stuff, we may end up with more money. <laughs> Maybe the same. Hopefully, not less. Um, but there might be some opportunities again for discretionary grants that we can partner with um, to do that. So, you know, an example: we go as far as Charlemont. And then from Charlemont until you get all the way to the Berkshires, there's nothing until you get, there's there's that huge gap. So, you know, we've been talking with Berkshire and with PDTA to see if the three of us could somehow coordinate to get people even from Springfield all the way into the Berkshires. Um, so it's collaborations, it's things that take time, it's creativity, it's, again, if we're only getting a year's worth of, of um, funding, how long is it gonna take for us to put this together? You know, how much money is it going to be? And then by the time you've started it and you're into it, People are getting really excited, and then it gets yanked out from underneath you. So we're going to try to be mindful of that, but I know that there's going to be some opportunities for us to apply for discretionary funding, and we want to try to see if we can think outside of the box a little bit. Would it be thing. helpful if Sunderland but had again, an initiative Sandra's for a very good friend of mine, like and that. Um, you know, not only are we work partners, but you know, we're friends as well. So we have these conversations on our way to Boston meetings and. So it's, it's constantly up there, but it's just a matter of how to kind of start that and make sure that it's successful and we're not failing at the onset. And that's kind of with the micro trades that we were able to start slowly and build up through that, that COVID so, process. But part of it is, maybe I'm wrong, is Sunder on the town would need to provide, so they have their money that they provide the PBTA for the services. Um, I'm assuming that they're not gonna wanna take away any of the over 60 to the PBTA because people still want to go to Hadley, mm -hmm. Northampton area. Mm -hmm. so this would be an additional money that Sunderland would have to set aside to then pay for those seniors that would want to go and use the FRTA services. Um, so there's a couple of issues. There's one is the towns need to be willing to provide additional funding and I think FRTA could provide estimates as to, you know, if you if you were to tell the FRTA that I, we think there's going to be 100 residents that are going to be using, going to, from here to there. They could ballpark what that might cost for the town, I think. Then there's the issue then, though, is how, because there's different systems, financially, there's the state bureaucratic red tape that is not the FRTA or the PBTA's fault. That is the state. <laughs> worked for the state Which, for 40 years. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so, the, but, but definitely the financial aspect from the town is one and, issue. And Joe is on the finance That's committee. That's right. Okay. So, so I am on the finance committee. Um, for for Sunderland? Sunderland? Okay. So how do you create that estimate? How, yeah. how do you, can you tell me right now it's $70,000, I mean, it's not that simple. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't want to oversimplify this, and I don't want to yeah. beat this to death. Yeah. If you live in Sunderland, my best advice would be to talk to your town officials. Talk, call the board of selectmen, call the town administrator, and tell them that there is a gap in service and that you need. Sunderland is already part of the PBTA, so you're already receiving services. Where those services are limited, I don't know. That's that's a PBTA question. So PBTA can provide those services. Sunderland's already part of PBTA. They should bring Just you to come where up we with need more to do. More funding to ex to if expand PBTA upon that. can't. Like if they go coming to Greenfield to go to Franklin Medical Center is just too far out of our way. We just can't. It doesn't make sense for us business wise. Then Sunderland could work with FRTA, and there is a there is a statutory way for one town to be part of two transit authorities. It's it's there is an estimate. It's not a simple calculation, um, but there are funds that the town would have to commit to. 
Um, at the end of the day, if it's something that you as a resident want, what you need to be doing, my best advice that I give to anybody that calls me and says, hey, I live in Oompa Loompa and I don't have a bus, my best advice is, is to call your town hall. Call, talk to the town administrator, the town manager, the board of selectmen, if you live next door, go knock on the door. Because if they don't know that there's a problem, we love you guys and we'd be happy to help, but you know, we have our own, like everything is governmental, so our hands are like. And you wouldn't have to reinvent anything right. because again, you're already paying PBTA, so maybe instead of, I don't know what, yeah. let's just say you pay them $5,000, instead of paying them $5,000, get more money to pay them $20,000 and see what they can do. And that should be, again, a process that PBTA um, can go through and can give you, you know, if you have an idea of, the type of service you want, if you want to try this on a trial basis, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, you think you have X number, work with the planning, work with us, work with Sandra, we can come up with a way so that, again, um, you know, you're already belonging to a transit authority, so there's no reason to reinvent something. It just may be a matter of expanding your ask of what it is that they're currently providing. So I have an idea, and this is something Michael and I talked about over a year ago. Um, so we weren't utilizing the van. The van that we have was given to us by Hatfield um, before the pandemic or around the time that the pandemic started. Um, and it just, we just started utilizing it, I wanna say in August um, of last year. So one of the conversations we had spoken about in the MARTAP grant for an accessible vehicle is opening up again, I think for October because they had to get through the contracts for 23, um, <coughs> I know that had been delayed. But Michael and I had briefly spoke about, you know, partnering up with the FRTA because we are part of an intermunicipal agreement where we are lately uh, Deerfield and Sunderland. So we could partner together, be mostly FRTA, but figure out how to utilize a vehicle where you know, we apply for the grant, whether it's together or separately or however it works to partner. So 80% is paid by the state, the 20% is in kind, whether it's through our funding or fundraising or however that's done. Because we now have a wonderful friends group. Hi, Carol. Um, <laughs> she's, she's on the board to, to do fundraising for us now. So that would help offset, you know, the 20% if that was something they were willing to take on. Um, but how could we work together with scheduling that or would that be a volunteer thing because MARTAP does have that other grant where it will pay up to 50% of someone to do the transportation piece and then we would fund, you know, however we could fund the other 50%. Honestly, I'll take it a different route. Rather than use your van and pay the insurance and the gas and the drivers and all of that stuff, we could apply for an additional vehicle if needed that yep. would help us out. And then just again utilize us for the services that you're you're looking to do because you know it's going to be expensive. We hear from people all the time they want to get their own van, and then when they realize how much just the insurance is, um, that's a deterrent for them because that's money you're going to have to fundraise every year no matter what. Um, well, we have in our budget uh, we budget around three thousand dollars for the van because we got it at no cost. But I'm not going to lie, it's 2011, so you know there are going to be things that are going to need to be replaced. So that's why I looked at the you know, the MARTAP or the other additional. Whether you purchase it outright and we create a partnership, now would you be restrained to only be in Franklin County or would you still be able to provide some support in Sunderland for just seniors that are part of the senior center? Because of the way we're funded and set up, we're just able to utilize it for the towns that belong to the FRTA even though Sunderland is part of the IMA that the senior center is under. I believe so. I mean, again, we look at that. Um, you know, I, again, my suggestion is you've already got services that you're getting from PBTA. You're already paying for them to some extent. You know, might, it might be worth it for you to reach out to Sandra at PBTA or, or one yeah. of her persons just to say, listen, would this make sense if you help us partner with this van so that we can utilize it for Sunderland since it's too much for you guys to come from Springfield because again, that's where they're home, you know, right. from Springfield, wherever they're coming from. And I think that that's part of probably what their issue is, is that, you know, it's such a long ways away where their home base is to come here. Um, now, whether or not you got a grant to purchase a vehicle through that and they housed it at UMass or something like that, that's a little bit closer. Um, 
But I would I would strongly suggest sitting down with Sandra and her staff. We have an email out to, to her. her. <laughs> we we can do that. Yeah. I'm going to see her tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. She we reached her, out a lot. Yeah, yeah. I told her that I would reach out to her mm-hmm. after this meeting. Perfect. So I can definitely mm-hmm. speak Great. with her about that and see if we can find a time as a smaller group just to establish yes. something and then try to work um, off of that. But again, you know, like I said, you're already established. It's not like you don't belong to the FRTA or the PBTA. Um, so my suggestion, you know, just for the sake of um, timing, because it's going to be a lot quicker. Yeah. It, the, the legislation, I think, that you have to go through to become involved with two transit authorities. Takes longer. It's, it's, it takes longer. It's time consuming. There's an approval process. I have not been through it. I think there's one other transit authority maybe that has experienced that, but I don't know. I, I figured we'd save that for the small, smaller yep. meeting. But I, you know, the larger questions and stuff, I think a lot of folks didn't have access to the information as much as hearing it directly from from the mm-hmm. two of you. Um, because as you did say, there's a lot of information on the website right. and sometimes you don't always know where the right place to go is. So mm-hmm. we wanted to just have a community conversation to see what we, you know, what it's been a conversation, there. honestly, that's been going on for years. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Megan, myself, Michael, we can attest to it. It's not something that's that's new within the past couple of years. I mean, oh, been, I don't doubt it. It's I been an ongoing issue that, you know, we haven't really been able to just to sit down on the light bulb before that going, hey, wait a minute. So, you know, again, with these discretionary grants coming up um, and with the budget um, being decided on right now, it, this might be an opportunity for us to... to this would be wonderful because you know one of the things um, we've been trying to do is to just create um, create the conversation amongst people who have interest but have not been asked to participate in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot more people be, were responsive with the UMass survey and some of the FERCOG survey. Um, so I think it's it's at the forefront and then. Um, aging in place is a really big concern for a lot of the folks at the senior center. Um, obviously, the conversation about transportation isn't just for older adults; it's for the entire communities right. that um, you know we're involved with. I'm just spearheading the conversation or getting the conversation started to bring it to see where or, you know what we can do, what we can change, or how we can work together. Because I think um, you know. Like you mentioned, you don't know if something's an issue if no one brings it, and that was part of our smaller work group discussion right. was to say, hey, how often do they evaluate these routes? How often do they evaluate the stops? And you know, where does this come from, and where does that come from? And you know, you've given a lot of good information. And again, today. there was a turnover in your position. You know, we get used multiple to times. Yes. Change. So you know, I um, now that we're having this and it's it's um, set up this way, I think it'll be a good you know going forward, we have contact, and we have somebody that's willing to listen, and and all of those things, so that definitely, definitely helps. Yeah, and, and we have a lot more participation from community members, too. I think, you know, um, there may not have always been that interactiveness on this side of the fence. Right. Um, you know, I can't speak for previous people. And, you know, and our volunteers, so. I was kind of chuckling earlier when you were talking about it, we have some volunteers that are older than the people that are transporting. I mean, I we had, we had one of those. Those. Somebody He's felt so bad yeah. about calling to ask. They're like, this person is older than me. It's like, but they're able to do it. Right. They want to do it. So you, you know, it's that way when your insurance agent calls, going, "Am I meeting this right? Is this person? You know, we've got to take a look at this." And but you know, I mean, it's it's if you're able to do it and you have a vehicle to do it and you're in the mindset of volunteering, definitely send them our way. And because we, you know, like I said, we've got a grant to expand that program, but it's hard to expand when we don't have the bodies to. That. Well, we're willing to partner to be a space if you want to advertise for jobs or come do just presentations, you know, to, to share about, hey, did you know we offer um, this job position and, or we're even the volunteer? Share that if you don't mind with Sandra as well. Because, oh, definitely. You know. Because that's that was one of the things that we want to talk with her about. You know, like we mentioned or asked about the ID location because we felt if you needed another location, we'd be happy to open up on a certain day of the month or a couple times a month or quarter to, yeah. to be like, hey, come get your IDs, pictures here. And we used to, back a while ago, we used to um, set up little field trips here in the center of town. If there was a group of, of people that wanted to go to Northampton for luncheon, we would meet them there, we would greet them on the bus, we would take them down, kind of, well, because there's that, that fear of the unknown. Most yes. of our drivers, um, their driver bids, but most of the drivers will bid on the same routes, you know, cycle after cycle, and if not, it's between one or two, so you get to know that, and after a while, if there's a pattern that develops, 
they're going to be like, oh my gosh, Tina wasn't on the bus today. She's I, we've been picking her up for two weeks. What's going on? You know, so okay. they look out for you. So it's not just a matter of your body on the bus and hey, we're getting off at Big Y. You know, and so and that's one thing that you know the scene for myself as the director here at the center is to facilitate community and welcoming. Um, and having an additional person and you know tool and partner in that you know is really important to mm -hmm. to me um, and I think it's important to you know the community members is to be able to to do that and I think given that we're going to probably schedule um, a, let's take an adventure on the uh, on the bus you know both the PBTA and the FRTA but that way we can help people navigate it and maybe do that you know once a quarter yep. just so folks become familiar and they know the driver or they can ask the driver the questions of, hey, how do I know where to stop? Are there different things? You do it now, all of us is free. Yeah, so <laughs> wonderful. Um, I'd love to thank you for your time. I don't know if there's any other we questions. We have one last Still? question. My wife is in a wheelchair yep. and she went through all that stuff to get her ID and all that. And it seemed like it took an awful long time to do that we went to the meeting had a meeting in, in greenfield and uh, it was open to the public we came in i assisted her in our wheelchair they wouldn't address too much every question that i asked we'll talk to you after the meeting after the meeting in other words after everybody's left what, what meeting was this and how long ago was it and where was it <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, the new center that's okay. in Catholic. We would not address our concerns in the meeting. Uh, we needed a ride for a doctor's appointment. She's in a wheelchair. Uh, from uh, Waitley mm -hmm. to Northampton. And the conversation came up, well, can you change your doctors? Because we can't do that part. I, I said, all right. Can you give me a ride to Boston? Which you can't do, right? Can't, can't do that. She needed a ride to a doctor's appointment. Called again. If you can meet us at the truck and ride, we'll pick you up. And she said, I'm in a wheelchair. So without having information, I don't know what meeting that was, when it took place, what it was about. And I, you know, we have to look into that. I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards to get a name and look into that. But I don't want to put them on the spot with a name unless you're comfortable doing that now. But I, you know, if it's an ADA ride, our hands are tied. We have to get within three quarters of a mile of the fixed bus route. There's no way around that. We can't transport to Boston, unfortunately, even with our med ride because it's a volunteer program and they're not set up to um, take wheelchairs so that's something that absolutely can't do I don't know what this meeting was about when it was or or who sponsored it or anything I, that's not something that we would do so I'm a little confused was on it for mass health was there a mass health hearing yeah it could have been a mass health hearing, hearing. I'm wondering. no no we're not on mass health so we're, but it, it was open to the public you know and that's what everybody wants to demand response I, I don't know. It just uh, was it recently a meeting? No, no. It's been been a little while now. She's been it's probably uh, over ten years now in the wheelchair. Yeah. No, I can't. Obviously, unfortunately, I can't speak to that because I don't know what meeting it's at. But okay. that's not something but, that we would. But you discuss. have your fancy little card that says you can get on and and mm -hmm. get your ride. Students can get on right here. Ride to Amherst, no fee. Ride back. They can do that a couple times during the day. Right, that's a PBTA thing. That's with UMass. We unfortunately don't get subsidized All right, from they, them. They can do that for free. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you're a senior and you go to, to one of these rides, you go shopping like you say, all the, you buy some groceries or whatever you buy, who's gonna help? Is someone gonna help you? Our drivers can only allow to get on the vehicle and off the vehicle. That's why we ask and we say that you can bring a personal assistant with you to help with that, that trip. And how many wheelchairs can you take on, on one of the buses? Are you just limited to one? No, you have to schedule ahead. 35 foot bus, if it's that big fixed bus route, I think it's up to four. 
the transit buses are two. And then the smaller uh, ones are two. Some of our smaller uh, demand response vehicles can take up to four, mm -hmm. depending on configuration. And, and what I don't think that you take into consideration is I don't hear anything about veterans. Mm -hmm. And veterans, if they're not 60, they should still be allowed to ride the bus. And to go through that car and someone give them a, a hard time, it, it's, it's, uh, my mother-in-law, she lived in Montague, and she would go uh, a couple times a week. And most of the seniors have problems walking. Mm -hmm. They either use a cane or walker. Mm -hmm. And the guy used to bring her right to her doorstep, get her walker out, make sure that she could go up to the door and get into her house. That could have been when GMTA was operating, but they were under a different charter than we were, so the rules and regulations but were different. You realize that seniors need help. I understand that. And and person in a walker, and most of the time you look, they got canes, and you just can't leave them. You can't leave them, and, and you have to be able to help somebody. Unfortunately, the way that our insurance works, we are not able to help anybody from the time they get off the bus to their doorstep in their homes, into grocery stores or medical appointments. That's why we've made the concession that if they bring somebody that can assist them, they either pay half fare or in some cases no fare. We can't be set up to help assist people. If it's a workers' comp issue, it's a liability issue, I know it sounds crazy, but unfortunately that's just the way that everything works in this world right now. So, you know, you're living in Waitley, we have the access program now, so that changes things for the way we can transport your wife, um, again, call either one of us, call the office, we'll walk you through it, we'll do what we can to help. We're not in the business to turn anybody away or to no, deny transportation. We can't go to Boston, That's we just we can't go to Boston, it's not anything personal. We are just unable to go that far. We have to keep it within a certain radius because of the way that our funding works and unfortunately we can't even bring it to Springfield. In some cases we can't even go to Northampton. But that's where you talked about this other group, Mom, Mom Talk, Montachusett, Montachusett right. that you can go with for, uh, for the ADA because she's in a wheelchair. And right. Well, if he's not in mass health, oh, it's not going to work. Because okay. no, that's only for people. So what Sorry. do I have to do? Get mass health? Get, get mass health? No. To Call our office if she's in the system. I will get her name unless you're comfortable sharing with the whole room. But I will get your name when I leave here. I will go back to the office, I will look through to see if she's an existing consumer, what we've got, what the, the issues are, if there's been anything that's been documented in the past, we'll call you back and we'll work through that. We, we haven't had you use your services because it's just been so not really convenient. My guess is, is that she was um, eligible for ADA services and because you're not within three quarters of a mile of our fixed bus route, she had to get to one of our fixed bus routes, which as I mentioned earlier, is not convenient for somebody that's mobility, visually, cognitively impaired to get within three quarters of a mile of our fixed bus route. Sometimes it's almost impossible, but that's the way the federal regulation is written. That's how it's been set up. It's nothing to do with the FRTA. That's the way it's been set up. So now that we have the access program, that opens up the doors a little bit more for other transportation options, and your wife probably would benefit from that at this point. I really recommend calling. They, yeah. the, Tina and Michael are the FRTA and they're really, they will work with you and call. They, they want to help you. They, Michael gives out his phone number to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the girls yeah. that we have in our call center are fantastic. Yeah. Um, I really so, you know, my guess is, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I remember your wife's situation and it was, it was something where because it was ADA and she wasn't within three quarters of a mile, but you know, to tell someone that they have to be at the, you know, the truck stop there in a wheelchair, yeah. it's yeah. just, you know, and if she's going to get there, she, you know. Exactly. If she can get there, then she can get to where she needs to go and not bother with us. Again, that's why I'm saying it makes no sense. No, <laughs> no. To me, it doesn't it does. make any sense anyway. No. But the way that our funding works and the way that, you know, everybody called that, that was within that system, we, we, there's no way to fund all of those trips. So that's why they put those types of guidelines in place. But again, now that we have the access program, you live in Waitley, that's one of the towns that benefits from it, she can get a ride on the weekend. She can get a ride during the week. Um, you just, you know, like I said, 
I'll meet with you after this. I'll get your name. We'll see if she's in the system, and I'll give you a call back when I get to the office. And, and a lot of times you have to go farther than Greenfield and Northampton mm -hmm. to get service. You have to go to right. at least to Springfield. And unfortunately, yeah. that's where we cannot help you. And yes. that's a, like a balance between the PBTA and such. But I think that there are some private... But now, if we can get you through the access program, if we can pick her up to Waitley and bring her to a situation in Northampton, then PBTA can pick her up in Northampton and bring her to Springfield because that's within their service area. So it takes a little bit of navigating, but it's possible and we can do it. And and I've seen times where uh, the driver's waiting out in the parking lot or whatever. So and a lot of times the doctor is probably running late or so no, now it late. runs into <laughs> Right. And that's when, you know, you call us and the girls will readjust the times that need to get picked up and, you know, we can't go there and sit there for an hour if you haven't made the phone call, but if you're making a phone call to say, I was supposed to be picked up at 3, it's going to be more like 3.30, we can readjust that so the driver can go back and pick up other consumers and then come back. We might have to wait a little bit longer because it's a last minute change or situation, but like Michael said, we're not going to leave anybody stranded. Thank you. You're welcome. So if there's no other questions, or if you have questions you think of after the fact, send them to me. I'm more than happy to forward them over. Um, but I hope this has been informative for everyone today. I think it's you know great to get some information. You may not have had things have changed in 10 years. And you know hopefully, there are some different things that can be e more easily navigated and hopefully help direct in different ways. So thank you so much to Michael and Tina for coming. Um, we really appreciate it.